videos for my honors biology class and we are currently starting um, unit three and unit three is going to be all about energy so we're going to start with energy and enzymes and then we're going into cellular respiration and photosynthesis so this is chapter six for my students focusing on energy and enzymes, and this is part one, so it's gonna be all about the energy. So if you're new to my videos, down in the descriptors, I have the group shared notes that my students use, um, as well as a link to, um, in, the, in the notes, a link to this presentation that you're watching right now, if that is helpful for you. Okay, so we are on 6.1 cells and the flow of energy. So the first thing you need to know is um, energy is the ability to do work or bring about change. Energy is the ability to do work or bring about change. Now, I want to put a little caveat on there that um, free energy is what we're talking about. That's the type of energy that can do work. So all energy is ultimately dependent upon the sun, right? And then we can harvest that energy in different ways, and we'll be talking about that this unit. But I also want to talk about the types of energy that is out there. So for instance, this little boy holding up this ball, right? That's potential energy because gravity can work on that ball and that ball can drop. When the ball is actually moving, the movement, energy of movement is called kinetic energy. Like all molecules have some form of kinetic energy. Like my hot cup of coffee this morning has more energy than later after this video when it's a little bit cooler. And that's because it will have lost some of that kinetic energy energy right to the environment and that is no longer useful energy right okay and then thermal energy is energy from friction here you can see light energy that can be harvested by pigments in plants and you can turn that light energy into chemical energy um, like ATP and glucose and we'll be learning about that process in photosynthesis and then you and I when we eat that chemical energy we will transform that again into ATP so on your notes kinetic kinetic energy is anything moving has that and potential energy is stored energy and then chemical energy is a form of potential energy that is stored in molecules that is stored in molecule and it's dependent upon bonds so if we're going to talk about energy we need to talk about the first and second laws of thermodynamics and have a good understanding of that here i'll be the sun yay okay so solar energy right can be harvested by pigments and it can be turned into chemical energy of glucose. So the first law is saying that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can just change forms. And that's referred to as the conservation of energy. So in our solar system, we have all the energy um, in our universe, we have all the energy we're ever going to have, right? All it's doing is changing forms. So as the sun breaks down, we can use that to our benefit, right? Because the sun is, is uh, the bonds and the molecules within the suns are releasing energy as their molecules break down. And then here on earth, we can harvest that energy from their breakdown and autotrophs, photoautotrophs in particular, can convert um, then CO2 and reduce it into sugar. So it's just changing the form in which it is. Now, that's the conservation of energy. It cannot be created or destroyed, it just changes forms. So on your notes under first law, states energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it can be transferred and transformed transferred and transformed. And then I gave an example there. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says every time it changes hands, you're gonna lose some of that as heat. And that heat that's just released, like think about when you work out, right? You're burning fuel that you have in your body to work out, lift weights, run, what dance, skateboard, whatever you're doing, but not 100% of that is going into your muscles, right? You can feel some of that coming off as heat. So it's not 100% efficient. That's why um, you might have a car, right? And it gives off heat as that engine is burning. So that is the second law of thermodynamics. And that, um, states that every time energy changes form, some is lost, some is lost, 
and um, it's not 100% efficient. Now, my students have already done a whole unit on ecology. And remember when we talked about the 10% rule, right? The amount of energy that is at the first trophic level at plants, that only maybe about 10% of that is getting transferred to the herbivores at the, at the second trophic level. And maybe only 10% of that, right, is going on to the carnivores. So this is why, the second law of thermodynamics. So the summary on that, the summary down below is you are next in the notes. You can't create energy. You can only convert. Can't create an energy, only convert. And at every conversion, some of that energy will dissipate, dissipate as heat and become less useful. So it's not useful energy. Awesome. All right. Let's go on next. And we're going to talk about entropy. Now look at this kitchen. It actually gives me anxiety to look at this kitchen because it's so disgusting. Um, at my house, like our kitchen has to be clean before we go to bed. I don't know what it's like at your house. So this, this is hideous. So this, I think we can agree that this is a very messy kitchen. And, and this has high entropy. And what entropy measures is the amount of disorganization. And due to that second law of thermodynamics, that every time energy changes forms, you lose some, right, as heat. So disorder is increasing here in this universe. And think about our own bodies. Our bodies are going to greater and greater disorder. So this is why we breathe and this is why we eat, is to fight that entropy. We have to put energy into our body system to fight its breaking down, okay? So... The weird thing about this though, when you look at entropy, this is actually very, very stable, right? Weird, I know, but it cannot get worse than what it is right here. So that everything's going to greater and greater stability and it's breaking down the second law of thermodynamics. Now look at this kitchen, okay? This kitchen brings me comfort. It's very neat, it's very organized, and this kitchen has more potential. You can do more with this kitchen. The entropy, if you look at your entropy chart here, the entropy is low. Now, how do you keep a kitchen clean? You have to constantly input energy into the system, right? But it is less stable. If you came running in here and you were hungry and you threw your back down, backpack down, you could knock over the bowl of fruit or whatever. So though it has more potential, right, it is less stable. But but you can do work in a kitchen that looks like this. So we're gonna apply it to the body, but um, the first, let's see, on your entropy, define relative amount of disorganization. So entropy measures the relative amount of disorganization. So this is low entropy, because it's very organized, okay? And this one back here is high entropy because it's disorganized. So take just a quick minute and I want you to think about your bedroom. On a scale of one to 10, 10 being the highest entropy of all, the most disorganization, how do you rank your bedroom right now? Is it is it a mess? Is it high entropy or is it neat and clean and has more potential in it? Is it clean, all right? Now let's apply this um, to a couple scenarios. Okay, so first of all, do you see how well organized this is? Everything's all stacked up and neat, okay? This would be a low entropy situation, okay? This right here, where it's disorganized in a way, this would be high entropy. This has, this has a lot of potential because it's organized. This doesn't have as much potential because it's not as organized, okay? And I'm gonna make a biological point about this in just a minute, we're getting there, okay? Look right here, this solid, okay? And you could think of like ice, right? Ice is a solid, it has more potential, more ability to do work, um, but as you melt that ice and it becomes a liquid, okay, it has more entropy as you go from solid to liquid and it is less organized and has less potential. All right, now let's apply this to molecules that we're gonna be talking about a lot over the next couple of weeks. Here's glucose, more highly organized. All those molecules are together. It, a glu glucose molecule has more potential energy because everywhere those molecules are touching cohesively as one unit, there's energy in those bonds, okay? And so glucose, if it gets broken down, it releases 
its energy, when it gets broken down, it loses its potential as it breaks down into CO2 and water. And the entropy is increasing as we go to carbon dioxide and water. Now, the good thing about this is all life takes advantage of this slide right here. What life? All life. It breaks down molecules, releasing energy. And what we try to do is harvest some of that in order to generate ATP. ATP is the dollar bill of our body. That's the energy we can spend in our cells is ATP. So through this process, cellular respiration, right? We break it down. We try to harvest it. Do we harvest all of it? No, we lose some as heat. Um, we're not super efficient about that. We're more efficient with it if we're doing it with oxygen. And we're gonna be learning all about cellular respiration next chapter. So on your notes for um, underneath entropy, I have that as an example that glucose breaking down into carbon dioxide and water is showing an increase in entropy. So we need to input Sorry, I need to check the next slide. We need to input an input of energy to fight entropy in our own bodies to maintain what? To maintain homeostasis. Now, the next thing I'm going to show you, I want you to really pay attention because um, there's not notes on it. But this is something we're going to look at at the end of this chapter and again in the next two chapters. All right. So keep in mind more together, more organized, is less entropy, but it has more potential, okay? So let's take a look at this next slide, okay? Here is a phospholipid bilayer. It is a membrane. Um, we have already studied those, right? So look right here on this side of the membrane. Do you see we're more organized? We have all the hydrogen ions on one side of this membrane in this first picture. Okay, but then on the second picture, the hydrogen ions are more scattered on either side. So which one has more potential energy? This one right here on the left. Because let me tell you, remember when we talked about diffusion is going from a higher concentration, right, to a lower concentration? So that's going to want to happen. Can these hydrogen ions go through the phospholipid bilayer? No, they cannot, right? Because we know you can't go through the phospholipid bilayer if you're what? If you're large or if you're charged, right? So these hydrogen ions are going to have to use this protein. I want you to envision this channel protein as if you're trying to get into Disneyland, right? Let me make myself a little bit bigger here just for a minute. Remember Disneyland? Okay. So when you want to go in and everybody's waiting for Disneyland to open and you have your ticket or your digital ticket, and you're trying to get in there. Everybody wants to get in there and get first in, in line to those rides. So you know how you go through those little turnstiles, right? So every person turns the crank of that turnstile as they enter. That's exactly what those hydrogen ions are going to do. So that's a lot of potential, just like a lot of people on one side of the gate at Disneyland all want to get in. In. And those hydrogen ions, because there's more on one side than the other, that's a difference in concentration. Because hydrogen ions are positive, that means there's a difference in charge. So that's another reason why, because there's a differential that way too. Difference in concentration, a difference in charge. And number three, remember, when you have a lot of hydrogen ions, you have a low pH. So there's a difference in pH. So they are highly motivated to go through that um, channel. And in fact, that channel, when we learn about that it's enzymatic and this channel's name is actually ATP synthase complex and when these hydrogen ions go through to the other side this is energy from that is captured to generate ATP to generate ATP so that is a the theme of this entire unit all right Hopefully that makes sense because we're going to revisit that a few times here. All right, so the next topic, 6.2, is metabolic reactions and energy transformations. So your metabolism, move over here, <laughs> your metabolism is just the sum of all your enzyme-mediated reactions that occur in your body is your metabolism. Some of those reactions are anabolic. They require energy and it's about building. Like you might be building muscle out of amino acids, right? Some of those reactions are catabolic. They release energy. You're breaking substances down. So on your notes, metabolism is the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in the cell. 
the sum of all the chemical reactions that occur in the cell or body like I have here. And you may, excuse me, you may want to add in there all the, the sum of all the enzyme mediated reactions that occur in your body. And if it's an anabolic pathway, then these are reactions that build, okay, that build. And photosynthesis is an anabolic reaction. In photosynthesis, you're taking CO2 and you're building sugars out of that. And that costs energy, right? To build something costs energy. Where do plants get that energy from in order to build, do that anabolic pathway of making, photosyn of making sugars? right? Where do they get it? From the sun, right? The sun provides that energy so plants can do that. And then catabolic reactions are reactions that break down. That would be a good example of that would be cellular respiration, right? And when you break those molecules apart, you release energy. And we, because we use it to generate a hydrogen ion gradient that I just mentioned, we can capture that energy to make ATP. All right, so then we need to talk about um, reactants versus products, which I'm pretty sure you already know this, right? So um, let's see, do I have, oh, oh, let me talk about this real quick, sorry. So here, a catabolic reaction, you can see right here, like breaking down sugar into these smaller molecules like CO2, that's a catabolic reaction that releases energy. And then anabolic reactions, you can harvest that energy in order to build something. So um, this right here is called a coupling. It's a coupling because one reaction that releases energy, you can capture that energy in order to build something. So this is a coupled reaction and we're going to see that theme over the next few weeks as well. All right. So now reactants versus um, products. So here you can see reactants are what you start out with. So in photosynthesis, you start out with sunlight and carbon dioxide and water. And then products are what you make like glucose, right? So on your notes, reactants, you want to say what you start with, um, they participate in the reaction. And then products are what you form. Products are what you form, and that is the result of the reaction. So reactants is what you start out with. Products is what you form. All right. Now, when we do these reactions, okay, we can measure, we can measure the amount of energy and where we're at. Do we have more energy at the end, right? Do we have more useful energy at the end? or do we have less useful energy at the end? And that change in free energy is called delta G. So you have that already in your notes. It measures, uh, you measure the energy changes and this is, the delta just means change and G is free energy. So we're measuring the change. So let's take a look at two types of reactions, two types of reactions. Okay, go. All right, so look at the start. Okay, here's like, it's up high, right? So it's got a lot of free energy. And then look down here, the ball is rolled down. It has less free energy. Now, a reaction like this, where you started off with more, okay? And, and energy was released. Now, we could have captured some of that energy, right? So I'm not, I'm not debating that. You could still capture it. But when, when a molecule releases its energy like that, you say its delta G is negative because you had more energy and now you have less energy. So if you did final energy minus initial energy, you have lost free energy in these molecules. So right here, that would be a delta G that is negative. Now, let's take a look at this endergonic reaction. This endergonic reaction, your reactants, I'm talking about your reactants, what you start out with versus your products, your products have more energy. That's an endergonic reaction. You're putting energy into it. So your delta G is positive because you ended up with more energy at the end. Now, if we put these two reactions together, we can couple them so that this reaction that loses energy, we can use that energy to build something. All right. So on your notes, on um, a negative delta G, on a negative delta G, you refer to this as an exergonic reaction, an exergonic reaction. You have a release of energy and the reactants had more free energy. The reactants had more free energy. And exergonic reactions are determined to be spontaneous reactions. So I'd like you to write that down too. 
Exergonic reactions are referred to as being spontaneous reactions. Now, intergonic reactions, this is when your delta G is positive, okay? And you have an input of energy. It takes energy to roll those balls uphill, right? And the products have more energy, the products have more energy than the reactants. All right, now let's talk about it in our body, all right? I want you to think of glucose as a $100 bill, all right? Now, if you wanted to go to Taco Bell at 10 p.m. at night, they don't even take $100 bills after 10 p.m. because they don't wanna deal with that cash money, right? You can't buy a soda at a soda machine with $100 bills because that is not something that works well in the soda machine. What you can spend well are dollar bills. So the energy currency of our body is ATP, and that's like a dollar bill. Now, I want to go back to this again. Taking glucose and cashing it into dollar bills, that is called cellular respiration. And when you do cellular respiration in your mighty mitochondria, okay, with oxygen, it's only about 39% efficient. Okay. And let me, let me explain what I mean by that. When you cash out your hundred dollar bill, it's like if I said to you as Mrs. Sullivan, Hey, you know, my friend, I have a hundred dollar bill and I really want to buy a soda in the soda machine or some water. Cause that would be more healthy actually. Um, do you have any dollar bills? And you're like, sure, Mrs. Sloan, I have some dollar bills. Give me your hundred and you only give me back $39. Is that a fair trade? No, but that is how efficient cellular respiration is. Remember, why is that? Because the second law of thermodynamics, right? Not all the energy is 100% transferred. So I only get $39 out of my $100 bill, and that's with oxygen. Now, we're also going to be learning about anaerobic respiration. That's without oxygen. How much can you get for your $100 bill? You want me to tell you how much you would give me? I give you 100 bucks you give me two bucks back in return. That is not very efficient at all, okay? But we'll be talking about that next chapter. All right, so let me go to your notes, okay? ATP is the energy currency of our body, so, and you already have that on your notes. So how do we spend ATP, right? So that must mean ATP has some energy in its bonds, right? So let me go over here. So here's, um, ATP. Here's adenine. Remember, that's one of the nitrogenous base. Remember, because ATP is a nucleic acid. Here's ribose. That's a sugar. And here's phosphate, phosphate, phosphate. So it's these bonds right here. This one in particular, that last phosphate, those are the high energy bonds. So when we say ATP has energy, it's not about the ribose or the adenine, it's all about the phosphates. And so if you break one of these phosphates off, and let me get my pointer real quick. If you break one of these phosphates off, look, we broke off a phosphate, that I just means inorganic phosphate. Oh, look what kind of reaction is this? Oh, here's the input of water. What is that called? Hydrolysis, right? We already learned that. So you're breaking off a phosphate, then it releases energy. About 7.3 kilocalories of energy is released every time you snap off a phosphate, and that can be used for cellular work. So on your functions of ATP, let's go look at what we can do with that energy we just released. Oh, sorry, I have another picture still. Okay, so here's an example of a coupled reaction. Let me let me spend some time on this. Sorry. So here, is, here are your reactants. C and D are your reactants. A and B are your products. A and B are your products. So here we're going from left to right. We spent an ATP to get this product over here. So ATP has gone to a lower energy level of ADP plus phosphate, but in the process of that, it released 7.3 kilocalories of energy, and these reactants got that energy. So A and B, we could say, have more energy than C and D. This is a coupled reaction. We coupled those two together to facilitate that endergonic reaction. Now let me show you another example of that, all right? Take a look right here, get your bearings. And this is relating what we learned earlier about catabolism and anabolism, all right? So look, look right here. Complex molecules like glycogen and protein and triglycerides, these, are, these could be nutrients, right? So when we do cellular respiration, when we break those molecules down, Okay, when we release the energy from them, yes, some will be lost as heat, right? 
but some of it will be harvested in order to generate ATP. So that's how you build ATP back up that we just spent is by breaking down molecules and releasing that energy from them. And then take a look over here. How do we use ATP in our body? Well, anabolic reactions that are a building process like building muscles or building enzymes that we need, right? That takes energy to do that. So we'll spend ATP in order to build those molecules, to do those anabolic pathways. Notice again, heat is released, why? the second law of thermodynamics, all right? Now, um, what kind, how do we spend that ATP? So let me just go back here. What are the things we spend our currency on? What do we spend our dollar bills on? So there's basically three types of work. So chemical work, chemical work would be something if you're gonna synthesize a molecule, like synthesizing this molecule to glow right here um, in the night. So chemical work is used to synthesize macromolecules. And you can see on there, that's an anabolic process. To build something is an anabolic process, okay? And then another way we do work, remember we learned about this, right? What are the three ways to cross a membrane, right? We can go through the phospholipid bilayer, but not if you are large or charged. You can use a channel or a carrier or whole membrane, endo or exocytosis. Now, remember when we talked about diffusion was going from a high to a low. So this first example here is passive diffusion, high concentration of oxygen to a lower concentration. Same thing here for sodium because it's got a positive charge though. It has to use a channel to do that. Same thing here for glucose because it's larger. But here is active transport. Remember the sodium potassium pump? That's when you're using a carrier to go against the concentration gradient. That requires energy. Whole membrane, endo and exocytosis, that requires energy. That's active transport. So that would be a second reason why you would spend your ATP. Used to pump substances across a membrane. Used to pump substances across a membrane. And then the third way would be mechanical work. So this would be like sliding actin and myosin across in your sarcomeres and your muscles, any kind of movement, um, cilia and flagella, that would be an example of mechanical work. So used to permit movement like flagella, used to permit movement like flagella. Okay, so that is gonna be the end of um, part two. I'm sorry, part one. Um, and our next video, part two, we're gonna start looking at um, some different metabolic pathways and how we use enzymes in that process. All right, I hope you are having a great day.